So that much as you, we will be starting off. My name is Dr. Iseko Iseko. I'm a physician cardiologist and with me is Olami uh, Polale, uh, also a physician cardiologist at Stadio Care. We are happy to have you join us again this month. Yes, because the important topic. Yes, yeah, so uh, you know it's coming from Cardio Care um, Hospital here in Abuja. And Cardio Care is a multi specialty hospital. We'll start straight off by sharing our slides uh, while we just discuss. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Any comments, put them in the comment box, and then we'll attend to them shortly. Also, um, um, we, we kept you muted. So if you have a physical question that you want to ask physically, we probably will have, you can raise your hand at the time, and we'll also attend to that uh, shortly. Um, like we've said, uh, we are from Cardio Care Hospital, yes, and that's the picture of Cardio Care Hospital. Um, essentially, what we do in Cardio Care is cardiovascular medicine, internal medicine, endocrinology. It's part of three hospitals, two other hospitals. Uh, we also predominantly do lots of cat lab procedures, treat heart attacks, pacemakers, you know, ICDs, ICDs cardiac respiration therapy, all the stuff. So, people with cardiac conditions don't have. Beyond that, we are also very search, and that is why we are here today. Um, if you are not watching us live, great. If you are watching us channels, that's also great as well. Those which are part of the mini hospital system to support ourselves and. Uh, you um, and share from what our find us about the and taking place on the December 8th as usual this is perhaps the biggest medical seminar in Nigeria right now and you don't want to miss it from any part of Nigeria you are in you want to make sure that you are here December 8th and 9th 10 CME points certificates uh, lots of stuff Dr. Yeah. Alekon, all the cardiologists and physicians here in Cardio Care are doing press up with their stuff. Yes. And we also need to have some eminent uh, yes. physicians also join yes, us yes, yes. in this year's uh, symposium. We'll bring them in, we'll hide their identity for now, but we expect to have some new faces coming uh, this year to explain to us several things. So we should have a fantastic time. This year also is a large case base. So we bring lots of cases, real life cases, and then we'll be solving it together so that we get a feel of what is done. So the other thing, what is heart failure? Everybody says heart failure. Has the heart stopped working? Should they, uh, <laughs> yes. what should happen? It, it, it is important to explain because once you tell people uh, you have heart failure, it's like the heart is, the heart has stopped working, but yeah. the person will tell you, but I'm still talking to you and still living, and I'm still able to do at least some amount of activity. activity. So, the, the use of failure in this regard is with caution. But what we mean by when we're talking about heart failure is one, we need to make it clear to our listeners that when we say heart failure, heart failure itself is not like a diagnosis. Exactly. Very it's, it, is, it is a syndrome, and when we talk of syndrome, we are talking of constellation of, of symptoms and signs. So, heart failure is like the end of vascular condition. Yeah. And what happened is showing that the heart is not function effectively. Okay. The heart to perform its activity. Simple Not that heart has stopped working. Not at all. Failure. So you can see the symptoms of the syndrome are difficulty in breathing, tired death or fatigue, clinical signs always there. So yes. you have to wait for that. And typical conditions, the poor quality of life, and the short of life. Diagnosis again, definition. definition yes. This is a confirmation of definitions which I like to use first. And 
said that the nozzle dysfunction um, or loss either or both that is primary systolic that is the pumpy primary diastolic or a mixture is characterized by left ventricle is typically dilated hormonal and neurological issues and circulatory abnormalities this essentially prevents heart failure so when we are treating it right we know that there is a problem with the pumping or the relaxation or, the relaxation. or both yes and we know that there is the dilatation of the heart or um, fitting heart was involved and we know primarily that beyond the circulatory abnormalities that we can see there are neuro hormonal yes. abnormalities that form a major part of uh, the heart failure system and they must be addressed for the patients to get better Title of this universal definition is uh, this universal definition of heart failure came into me because looking at the different definitions of heart failure that we've had over the years, we find that most of the, uh, most of the definitions were more of theoretical. Yeah. And they are not practical. They are not something you can demonstrate in most of the patients having heart failure at the bedside. And yeah. that is why this universal diagnosis, uh, definition of heart failure that comes into play. That when you want to say someone has the heart failure, that's symptoms of heart failure. We talked about facts. Whether there's either in this Edema or not. Yeah. Then of cardiac dysfunction or that you need to see whether enzyme in the blood that is a you have objective sign about it in the arts, whether Maybe constructor abnormality, a bastolic abnormality, or if you are in a facility where you can do, you are able to measure the pressure in the heart and you are able to identify elevated pressure in the heart. So when you put all these together, you know, these are things you can do by the bedside. The symptoms is there, yeah. you can pick signs. If you take blood to the lab, you can get elevated BAP. And if you have facility for echo or advanced invasive hemodynamic uh, study, you can get some of these things. So and what, what you are saying is that this is Oh, okay, so sorry about that. We went offline briefly. Um, what we we're saying was we we're talking about uh, universal. universal definition, and by as part of the, the universal definition, we we're saying that echo is critical. Having end terminal for BMP is also critical for it to happen. Just a minute. Let's see how we can share our slides. So echo is critical, and that can be done in uh, most big uh, hospitals of cardio care. Doing BMP or end terminal for BMP is also quite critical. So if, if, you are, if you are here, it typically takes 15 minutes, you have the end terminal for BMP, and it typically helps you very well to be able to decide, you know, how to do it. Now you also see that there are differences in the cut off point, whether the patient is ambulatory, or hospitalized. The reason is that when people are hospitalized, the PMP may elevate for different other reasons. And so you get a higher value 
to discriminate for whom you have to know. And then things like x-ray, clinical examination, symptoms and signs can must be there. So once you have your symptoms and signs, consider giving a billion enter plan for BMD. You cannot do it in your center, you can take a sample of the blood, send it to cardio care, in a few minutes it will give you that diagnosis. And it has a very good discriminatory uh, value in terms of defining. If you have all your heart symptoms, difficulty in breathing, and you are unsure. If you do the enter plan for BMD, you can do a large enter plan. Yes. Then go on to echo and check is PF low or is P over E prime yes. uh, elevated yes. 15? Is there dilatation or hypertrophy of, of the chamber? You know, and then are there any other things that will help suggest that the heart is struggling? That's chronic dysfunction, any valvular abnormality, exactly. all this. Yeah. So those are the things that we consider in the definition of, of heart failure. I hope it's quite simple. Uh, so far. So, if you look now, we're talking about heart failure and how it's very deadly. What do, what do you think? When we talk about heart failure, people think it's a small yeah. condition. But according to studies, in, and in every adult in an adult lifetime, one out of five people will develop heart failure in their lifetime. And heart failure is deadlier than many cancers. In within five years of diagnosing heart failure, fifty percent of patients will die within five years. So and that's worse than most of the cancers. It's not something to take lightly at, at all. all. Also, when I had the diagnosis, especially a proper diagnosis, echo with DFP, with clinical signs and symptoms, you should not take it lightly. It's not the one that is okay. It's not malaria. And the person is better does not mean that you should just go away. Yes. They need to continue to have problems. And it is Likely very good to make sure that they see a specialist at diagnosis and at least once in, his, in his several months. And at least once, maybe in a quarter. In a quarter at the least. So they might continue following up with you, but we we'll make sure that try and see them to a specialist so that you can pick up all of these things. It is a deadly disease, and it, but it's something that we can do a lot about. Yes. Okay. So we also know that there's a uh, lifetime risk and that it worsens over time. So for us, we can take up this slide. Yes. Heart failure is not just a static condition. Yeah. It is a progressive condition. And that is why we will do things right from the start. And if you look at the chart we're looking at, over time and the clinical risk. Yeah. So once you make that diagnosis, we must ensure that we're able to start appropriate treatment as early as possible. And even when we get to the classification and stage, you will see. And that is why the American stages of heart uh, yeah. failure is very important. Yeah. Because they are, we are not trying to catch patients even before yeah. they yeah. develop symptoms so that we can start appropriate either lifestyle modification or some treatments that can even prevent someone from getting to the point of having symptoms so that we can delay as much as possible this progression. Yeah. Because once the person starts having symptoms, you start treatment, the patient enters a plateau phase that is determined by a lot of things, depending yeah. on age, some comorbidities. But sometimes along the line, you now start having frequent acute decompensation. And once you start having this acute decompensation and frequent hospitalization, yeah, the then that... the, the, the person is on the stepwise and gradually to, you get to the advanced stage where patient is it's almost, I it's think almost it's gone, dependent on devices, dependent on hydrotropic support. So, heart failure is a progressive disease. And this is why it's important to get a treatment early. Because uh, you don't want to be having a treatment coming when you're already at advanced refractory heart failure. Even a bit of treatment, yes. the heart failure is not having any improvement. We also want to put in um, devices early. ICD CRT as indicated early so so that we can have a better outcome. We don't want to wait till it's very late. So yes. um, it's a vicious cycle and it's progressively worse over time. Okay, so this is quite important. I think we have talk, talked about it. So what causes heart failure and how does it resolve? Um, in our practice in Nigeria, these are the typical causes: valvular heart disease, hypertension. You know, high output peripheral disease, um, but I will specifically focus 
of these ones that are the most common in our practice. The cardio care hypertension is still number one. Yes. We have coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy. In the South Africa African survey, hypertension accounted for close to 50%. Yes. And then we now have the acute cardiomyopathy. Of course, in cardio care, because we're a referral center for cardiology, cardiovascular conditions, and we do a lot of in cardio, interventional cardiology. Yes. So we are seeing a lot, are seeing a lot of, of patients with coronary artery disease. Whether it is a reflection of what it is in society or because we are Every, most people with coronary artery disease in the entire northern Nigeria have to come to cardiac care at some point in time. Maybe that's why we have a relatively higher proportion. But suffice to say that it's quite important in it. Um, and looking at those causes, it is important because, you know, when we're talking about heart failure, that heart failure is not a diagnosis here in this case. If you don't identify the underlying cause and address it, there is no way our patient will get yeah. better. So, we have to identify what the underlying causes in order to help the patient to get better treatment and management. Okay, so essentially what happens is the central point of all of this is what we call ventricular remodeling. Yes. There's nothing more than the heart changing in shape and its pattern structure to be able to cope with all the problems that is happening. So whatever happens causes injury to the myocytes and that causes that to be structuring. Uh, not na natural restructuring in Nigeria. <laughs> this is restructuring in the heart. In the heart. <laughs> that leads to electrical instability and alterations in ejection fraction mm. or diastolic function. This now triggers a neurohormonal cycle. Yes. That is the critical thing that is there. So while we are treating heart failure, we try and address the electrical instability, we try and address the neurohormonal imbalance, we try and address the injury to the myocytes and we try to address all the symptomatology to be able to get the most out of it. And if you don't cut that cycle, it becomes a vicious cycle. Yeah. The cardiac output yeah. is low. That leads to stimulation of a lot of this new renin, either sympathetic uh, axis, renin angiotensin axis. So the treatment of heart failure is targeted at most of all exactly. these underlying. Pathophysiological mechanism. Once you understand this, you understand how to do it. Yes. So you will see that the dioxin, okay, two semi, are not things that will really affect this new hormonal pathway. Yes. They are not things that will affect a lot of it. They might give some symptoms with it, but they will not likely change uh, mortality in the long run. So you have to be careful uh, when you're just looking on the dioxin and say, okay, they are better, two semi, and some other treatment. You must make sure that you are going to put them on treatment that will actually stop the progression of the disease. Yes. And this is part of the reason for this. So, uh, thank you for those that are just joining us, uh, that are joining us late. We are calling from Cardio Care. And we'll remind you about the Abuja, 6th Abuja Cardiovascular Symposium on the 8th and 9th of December. 10 CME points here in Abuja, not far from Cardio Care. And critical topics. We are going to go into all of this. And you meet all of us about six different consultants here so that you can ask all your questions one-on-one -on -one and you can go in depth with lots of things. So please make sure you go and re register online and get your institution to register as well. So, so how do we classify heart failure? A lot of classification has been used, yeah. but let's just focus on the one that is trending. Let me use the word trending yeah. and the most to sense. And it is based on the ejection fraction. So, and you cannot get ejection fraction without it. It's not possible. Uh -huh. so, it's not possible. So, we want to classify our heart failure based on the ejection fraction, whether the ejection fraction is low, whether it is normal, and whether it is somewhere in between. And the cutoff that is used is if the ejection fraction is less than 40%, the patient has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Okay. If the ejection fraction is 50 and above, yeah. the patient has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. All right. Then when you have someone in between 40 to 50, the patient has heart failure with mildly reduced ejection, ejection fraction. Now, you must be careful now because I see a lot of people who send the patient for echo before surgery, surgery, and they say, what is the EF? You don't want to read any writing in the echo report. What is the EF? Once they hear EF is 60, they say, okay, we are good to go. So from this, you can see 
close to 50% of patients with heart failure ah, have normal ejection fraction. fraction. Yes. So just having a normal ejection fraction does not exclude uh, that. That's why you make sure that your echo is done by qualified individuals. So that it's not just that, okay, ejection fraction is good. What is the over E prime? Always look for E over E prime. If it's bigger than 15, then you are most likely having heart failure. If it is 12 to 15, then you are in that mid range and you will typically have to do BMP to help you. And less than eight is less likely. Not impossible, it's less likely. Okay, so the other ways. Yes, based on clinical presentation, you know, when we, we said heart failure is a chronic condition. condition. So, can have someone in the chronic stable heart failure yeah. on medication, doing well, then a patient. Though chronic cannot come down with an acute presentation, yes. maybe there's a decompensation due to some of the factors that will be mentioned. That yes. maybe a patient with heart failure feels that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling better now, I can stop taking my drug, okay? They could come down, or maybe a patient with heart failure came down with chest infection or had heart attack. Yes. So there could be an acute decompensation, what we call acute decompensated heart failure or acute heart failure, or a patient can be in a chronic state. Then, based on the severity of the symptom or yeah. dyspnea, yeah. we'll talk about that very soon using the New York Heart Association uh, with the American Cardiology uh, American Heart Association staging, which we'll also talk about very soon. So we have over 100 participants from all over the country joining us, and I just remind you from Cardio Care Hospital. Uh, we are teaching on heart failure, and so far we are trying to define it yes, to understand the pathophysiology. And that the pathophysiology is not just pumping; it's about neurohormonal imbalance and ventricular remodeling that happens. And we also talk about how we can classify it. And we've told the importance of an echocardiogram and BMP, uh, B uh, B type uh, natriuretic peptide or N terminal B type natriuretic peptide. So very important in making your diagnosis. And um, we are not talking about the classification. This was part of the classification of the EF that Dr. Ralekon just talked about, you know, which re reduced. Um, then sometimes we have heart failure which improved. Yeah. And if they had that heart failure reduced, they started treatment, treatment. and that is why treatment is good. Yeah. This is why we are teaching this thing, because we know people can actually get better. Yes, I saw a patient yesterday. The first time we saw him was July. Okay. When we admitted him, it was a cardiogenic shock. Wow. The EF was between 25 to 30%. Wow. And within uh, if, uh, July till now, within three months, you will hardly be able to recognize this oh, same percent. His EF is around 40 to 45%. He's gone back to work. Someone that could not tolerate uh, Luperio and this Bisopulo initially with cardiogenic shock. Can now take 50 milligram BD of Luperio wow. and Bisopolar and it's doing very, very well. So you can see that there is this area now improved. These are the people that will give testimonies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Hathaway with mild reduced EF and Hathaway with just yes, exactly. yes, Now, this NYJ class is the one that they taught us in medical school. Yes. In class four, nothing. They are breakers at rest. In class one, they almost don't have symptoms. While in class two, they have symptoms of on a little bit higher than normal like physical activity. And class three, small activity may make them uh, breathless, less than ordinary activity. So very simple. Class four, even at rest is a problem. Class one, can, can you hear us very well? I think it's the it's the, it's the rain. rain. Oh, sorry, it's raining cats and dogs here. We will speak a little bit louder as much as we can. But so class four, you cannot, the patient is uncomfortable, room at rest. Or even when they wear their clothes, they are uncomfortable. While class three, you know, small distance from the bed to the door, yeah. they are breathless, you know, less than ordinary activity. Class two, ordinary activity, climb up a slight of stairs. They know they cannot do everything as usual, you know. They cannot dance buga, you know. <laughs> And class one, <laughs> you know, some of that thing. Mm. So that, that is essentially what it is. This ACC stage, can you go through this ACC stage? Yes, this, ta this staging is very, very important. Yes. Because if you look at New York Arts Association classification, yes. it's classification based mainly on symptoms. But ACC and HAA staging is helping us to catch patients early. at a very early stage. 
So in stage A, this patient does not have any symptom. This patient does not have any heart abnormality or structural or functional abnormality, but this patient has risk factors. Yeah. And what are these risk factors? Hypertension, Hypertension diabetes, obesity, previous uh, stroke, any atherosclerotic cardiovascular so disease. Sure, are you saying that everybody with hypertension is always to get a heart failure? Yes. Wow. Anybody, even someone with family history of cardiomyopathy yeah. is in stage A. And so these are people you want to make sure that lifestyle modification starts is early. Starts. Frequent screening. Exercise. These are people that must exercise, that must check cholesterol, sugar, and others frequently. Then stage B. Stage B, they are still asymptomatic, but you now have evidence of structural and functional this is one of the reasons why almost every patient, in fact, every patient with new diagnosis of heart failure typically has to be, um, typically has to be, have an echo. Yes. Once you make a little hypertension, please, it's already telling you that the patient is already at high risk. So have an echo so that if there's any dysfunction, we can start treating before they develop symptoms. Yeah. By the time they're getting to stage C, they already have symptoms. symptoms. And by stage and D, those they are the already in the hospital. Yes, stage C, are the, they typically will come by themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then by stage D, they yeah. typically have to be admitted. If fractured, things Absolutely. are bad. We're going to move a little bit faster so that we can get up with time. Um, so this is the trajectory of heart failure. Typically, a patient who has newly diagnosed heart failure and no previous history. Sometimes they get some resolution of the symptoms, and then in most cases, it progresses to a persistent heart failure. Yes. Now, if you have good treatment, you can keep them in this stage mm -hmm. with resolution some of symptoms, symptoms and yes. persistent in between. But in some cases, it relentlessly you know, progresses and worsens, sometimes even with very good treatment. So yes. it's difficult to know. Even in the best of places, of places. Or centers. Is a continuous with all the disease, so that's what are some tips we need to order. So, how do we recognize and diagnose heart failure in our clinical practice? What are the things that we need to um, do or know? So, these are some of the symptoms. Uh, you know, difficulty in breathing. We've talked about it. Yes, sir. Difficulty in breathing when lying flat, and then PND. This one typically you need to ask: Is there any time you wake up at night with difficulty in breathing, or you have to go to the living room? Some patients will think that it is their room that is stuffy. But no, the action of standing up and moving to the week to whatever. So now patients patient will think they have uh, asthma. Yes. And say so anytime they die at night, they have this problem. So these are things that you should look out for. That there are so many other symptoms. Signs of of congestion, head heart sound, JVP elevated, you know, edema, a fast heart rate. Then die apart to make you know, even headache. Yes. You know. But whether you have that, you must come back. One of the key things that is there, though, is difficulty in breathing. And that is what one of the things we must use to classify that heart failure. So what test are you going to do for it? So after picking your symptoms, you pick your important thing on examination, then what next do you want to do? The basic investigation you must do. Number one, your patient must have an ECG done. By force, your patient must do an echocardiography. By force, your patient should do a BMP check. Well, if you have, if have you have, or if you don't then have. your patient should do a chest x ray, a full blood count, and electrolyte urea and creatinine. Yes. Those are the basic tests yes. your patient must do. They help you to know the cause, precipitants, and also to confirm your diagnosis. So the BMP will usually be normal. Though there are other conditions where you can have elevated BMP. But yeah. in the presence of all those symptoms and signs we talk about, heart failure will come in place. ECG, yeah. you will hardly have a patient with heart failure having a normal ECG. There will be one abnormality or the other. Even if it's just a sinus tachycardia, yeah. there will most of the time be an abnormality and it is compulsory. For your patient to have an ECG and echo, because without echo, you can't even place your patient in terms of oh, classifying and the even and even help with treatment. So yes. here, you see some of these things. You say, okay, um, some Nigerian patients are not well to do. How can we make? Do? We have to make do. We must find a way to make sure that we get it done. 
one way or the other. So if does your hospital not have an ECG or an echo, please impress on the hospital managers or uh, if the patients can afford it, you know, get them to a center where they can have it. Now, thyroid function has been recommended in all cases because occasionally I've had a patient that there's, there's no risk factor, it looked like just heart failure symptoms, preserved the digestion fraction. And once I did it with TSH, it showed me she was, she was hyperthyroid. And you need to treat that. These things, however, are, you know, but at least do a TSH. That will help. Do your cholesterol, do other tests. Um, in COVID period, it was good to do COVID as well. Uh, that is important. Now, troponin. Troponin, yes. especially if you are thinking of myocarditis. Anytime you are saying patient has myo cardiomyopathy, that you don't know, there's no blood pressure, patient is not diabetic, please do the troponin because ongoing inflammation of the cardiac muscle will raise the troponins. Yes. And then when you do a good echo with speckle tracking, you will see characteristic findings on the speckle tracking Doppler that will help you clean the diagnosis. And you know, sometimes those things can be reversed. A lot of the dilated cardiomyopathies that we don't know what caused it are typically from some of these things and they can be treated. And your patient may also, can also be having an heart attack. Yes, at the same time. and that's why you need to do the troponin at that time. Now, when you are doing the when echo result comes to you, don't just look for ejection fraction that we have yes, said. Sir. Look for E over E prime. Look for wall motion abnormalities. Mm -hmm. Look for the speckle tracking Doppler. A lot of echo. So sometimes you need to call back to your cardiologist and say, "Sir, I did not see E over E prime," so that they can do they can check it and do it for you properly. Okay, and then the valve function. These are some of the things that are important. So can you go through this one? So this is just putting everything that we have said about diagnosis together. That. One, the first thing is good history to assess symptoms, to look for causes, yeah. to look for precipitants, physical examination to identify the important finding is JVP, S1, S2, S3, tender hepatomegaly. Then you want to do your ECG, you want to check your BMP, you yeah. want to do your echo. Yeah. So when you have done this, with the aid of your echocardiography, now you will now be able to place the patient into the category the patient belongs, whether preserved, whether reduced, or whether mildly reduced. Then you now proceed to your management, which we'll start talking about, about in the next slide. Okay. I hope we are having fun. And <laughs> I don't know that it's fun, but I hope we are learning. We have over 120 people on joining us uh, for those that have joined late we talk about heart failure and then uh, some cardio care for specialty hospital this is one of our outreach um we do it every month and at the end of the year december 8th and 9th we have the abuja cardiovascular symposium the sixth edition typically it's a lot of fun time we have over 400 people over two days and we do lots of hands-on and explanations one-on-one -on -one. so we want to make sure that you are there december 8th and 9th make sure you plan your leave ahead Yes. or get your hospital to approve it. It is the biggest and largest medical seminar in Nigeria where there's just teaching directly. So we've talked so far, now we're on diagnosis from cardio care. We talked about heart failure being predominantly a clinical diagnosis, but you need echo, you need ECG, you need all of that to help because heart failure is a syndrome. Now you must look at the other components of the diagnosis. Yes, sir. That is number one, the syndrome. So you say heart failure with preserved or whatever. Next thing you should talk about is the etiology. So you cannot just tell me, I'm referring a patient to you with heart failure. Ah, I'll say, why didn't you join our webinar? You should say the patient is someone with heart failure, yes. You should, you should attempt to have the EF if you don't have, if you have an echo machine. The next thing you should do is to tell us the cause. What do you think the cause is? Then you should classify it based on the NYT class that we've talked about and the ACC stage. And you can easily just download these calculators online. Then check, is there a precipitant? Is there anything that's making this thing worse now? And then any other comorbidity. So a complete heart failure diagnosis will have these five components. So see an example. Heart failure with this ejection fraction, secondary to hypertensive heart disease, NYH class four, AC class three, precipitated by new onset atrial flutter and chest infection, and has comorbid delta attacks. This is an actual patient diagnosis. Yes. When you tell a colleague this, the, the person will not ask you, is the patient breathless because you are, you are Already said NYHA4. So he exactly. knows this patient is breathless at rest. Exactly. And you know, this is why you write this kind of thing. Oh, we are so happy. It means that these teachings we are doing are not in vain. And we will be really excited 
I will call you personally myself. We tell you thank you for listening. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> All right, so um, going for that. So how do we treat heart failure in our practice? Uh, so number one treatment principle is counseling. Yes. I know what to say, drugs or whatever. No, number one is education. This is a lifelong disease. This is a disease you don't want to put to say. To get, we need for adherence to treatment, how follow-up will be, we need for specialist review, and if you have support groups in your center, we are starting our heart failure support group there, then how they can join, we need to explain diet, we need to explain the need for procedures. So occasionally, some procedures like we do in cardio care, cardio care one of the few places in Nigeria that does those procedures, they may need procedures, they may need devices, they may need procedures to find the cause, they may need procedures to treat certain aspects of it. So, you need to take time and counsel and educate. This is not something you should rush. No, on. It, it is very important. In, in the last two weeks, we've seen about four young women with wow. pancreatic cardiomyopathy wow. induced heart failure. Wow. As in, it, it, it took us a lot of explanation because you have to tell someone with a weak old baby, this is something we have to do. This may affect lactation. Yeah. You cannot breastfeed baby. Yeah. Possibly you may not be able to even call, as in, we, we, we may likely advise you not to have another pregnancy infusion. So, but this is something we must do if we want to achieve exactly. any results in this. And when it's done well, I've had one, one peripatum. And after the treatment, in one or two years, time, EF was back to 65%. The patient was perfectly fine. In fact, she has had another child. If yeah. not, no. <laughs> so it's important for you to take this time and counsel and educate, not just the patient, but the family as well. Mm, yes. And this is a continuous process. It's not a one-off thing. Every time they come, you need to take time and talk about that. So what are the treatment principles? Reduce the preload and afterload. Treat the neurohormonal abnormalities. Yes, consider other medications and consider device therapy. therapy. So when you are treating reducing food and afterload, a lot of this is typically symptomatic. Yes, congestion. It's congestion. The patient will thank you, but the patient may not be there to continue to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Give the person directed to reduce the fluid. Your aim is to achieve 0 0.5 to 1 kg weight loss per day initially. Then later to maintain symptom free. Yes, typically, sir. we start with fusemide or tosemide, but it may be higher. Okay. And you should also consider the E and U with this. Now, the next thing, of course, is to treat the neurohormonal yes. abnormalities. Yes, and like you said, the neurohormonal abnormality is the most important thing yeah. you have to identify in patients with heart failure. And what are these neurohormonal uh, axes you want to target? The sympathetic system, yeah. the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, exactly. and now we are also adding the SGLT into, into, into the mixture. And so the current key treatment axis for heart failure is targeted towards this pathway, which we can quickly see here. So we want to give something that we work on the angiotensin 2 pathway. Yes. We want to give something that work on the sympathetic axis, that's the no epinephrine, something that will block the aldosterone working okay. in the patients, right. there's something that will work on the SGL2 and the nephrilizing pathway. Okay. So that is what makes up this neuro uh, abuna, uh, abnormalities. And the other medications, they are now together. They are now together. together. So, and then of course, when they do need, they need device therapy. Then if we will now add that. So if you still have your injection fraction, after you are giving proper treatments, and if you have ejection fraction after 40 years of proper treatment, less than 35, uh, or the patient is having frequent ventricular, um, ventricular ectopic, yes. you should consider having an um, ICD. That patient. will help reduce sudden deaths. It's critical and it prolongs life. You know, there's a patient who puts uh, an ICD on Friday. By Sunday, he had a very severe shock and we saw this. Ah, if we, we did not put it on Friday, it would have been all over. We discharged a patient yesterday. He had his uh, ICD close to a year ago. And I'm sure the man would have been thinking, why did I wait too long? <laughs> but right on admission, yeah. He had a shock. He, had, he, 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 he wanted to stand and he fainted. And in split of second, he came back again. And when we interrogated, he had a beating. 
that was aborted by the, by the by ICD. The device. So you can see that it makes a whole lot of difference. That would have been somebody that would have said sudden no, death. Hey, yeah, yeah, I know it's from the village. No, there's no remote control. <laughs> we have the opposite of remote control. <laughs> okay, and then some people have need with circumcision devices, especially when heart failure is very advanced. And so those are some things. So again, the five pathways are angiotensin two. Typically, we we use uh, valsartan or AC inhibitors. Yes, sir. The norepinephrine typically use beta, beta blockers. The alnoplosterone typically we use uh, uh, spironolactone or epilerenone. Mm -hmm. Nephrolysine pathway typically we use um, uperio. uperio like um, and then SGLT2, empagliflozin, and dapagliflozin. I think we have a, a very beautiful. Picture. Oh, beautiful! So this is how we use it. These are the main treatments. So fusemide is good, though. And you will see it's the that congest, uh -huh. congest, if congested under the beta block. Uh -huh. So fusemide is good, though. All those other things, digitalis, digoxin, mm -hmm. is good, though. But among the ones that will typically make a difference, they are not really there. So you should be, you should make sure that when you are treating a patient, that the patient These four. are there. Now, a patient may not be able to take all the four at the same time. Occasionally, it will have to gradually include them one by one okay, yes, over time. But you should make sure that at least they are represented. So if you look at this one, typically start with ACE or ARB, then yes, we go, or you start with R9. That is um, Sacubitri Valsatan, uh, which is typically known in this part as Uperio. And then you could, of course, uh, beta blockers, typically when the patient doesn't have too much fluids, um, Cavendilol, Bisoprolol, or Metoprolol Sosinate. Not metropolar tartrate. Sustate. Sustate is the long acting one. Okay, so you should typically check for that. Not at 10 or not. Not at 10 or not. No. Not for one or not. Please. Please and please. I'm begging. You. Just imagine I'm kneeling down. Please, no propan or not. Please. So those are some of the things. Then M um, narcotic antagonist, that is spinolactone and epiridone. Now we have a pleurinone now, and then SGLT2 inhibitors. Now there are others that may be. Yeah, uh, very cigars, yeah. I'd rather see Ivadabi. Sometimes you do that, but typically not, you typically have to do that at specialist level. Okay, so these and are the things. Bef before we leave the drug, yes, sir. let me also talk about drug that we should not give. Oh, perfect. Knife and pain. Do, do I have you somewhere on this knife? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't okay. Think so. <laughs> drug that we should not give. Drug that will further worsen the patient's patient clinical patient. condition, please. Not a uh, di not diadropidine passion channel blocker. Yes. Verapamil, diutiazem. Yes. Nifedipine. Please, yes. we should not give our patients. Patients with heart failure, steroids, aspirin. Oh my God. NSAIDs. Ibuprofen. Um, uh, Diclofena. Oh, what, what again? Naproxen. Yes. Please, if you give that, you're going to worsen kidney function. Go to worsen heart, heart function, fluid go to worsen fluid retention. Patient typically will have to be admitted. So you need not only do you not give them, make sure you warn them about it. There are other ways to take care of pain. And if the patient are already on those drugs, we may need to take stop them, them and give them alternative. Sometimes even topical NSAIDs will have an, an, an effect. That is what they are rubbing. So it's not just that they don't have ulcer, that's why you don't give them. They have heart failure. And that is critical. And so if you make sure that you are We are saying this because these are some of the things we are saying. I, I saw a patient just yesterday he, he developed heart failure after a miscarriage at 22 weeks. Oh and my God. she was hypertensive before pregnancy. And during pregnancy, she was on nifedipine, algromet, oh. and she was still on the actual dose medication. And the, the edema was up to the time. Wow. She only can sleep sitting. She cannot even lie down at all. Wow. And the nifedipine and the other drugs were greatly contributing to the, to to the, the heart failure treatment. Those are things we need to consider. So treat the etiology, like Dr. Olajuko said earlier. Optimize other cardiovascular risk. Take care of the sugar. Take care of the cholesterol. Make sure the blood pressure is well controlled. If the blood pressure is not well controlled, that patient will not get better. Yes. Because the heart is pumping against a yes, higher pressure. The afterload is very the afterload is too high. So you need to take it down. The diastolic cannot be 90 something. You are not going to make any much progress. If the other precipitants need to treat them, infection, if there are new arrhythmias, fluid overload, any drug that could have caused it, you need to take them out. And that will help us to treat. So these are the principles. 
Whenever you see a patient, keep in mind this principle. Number one, counsel the patient. Yes, Number two, choose the correct drug therapies. And we have showed you the four major ones. And then the other ones that are needed, full semi and the like, to help with the symptoms. Then treat the etiology, optimize other risk factors, cholesterol, sugar. You can see it's already a, an expensive um, adventure. This is why you must take care of your blood pressures very well. Then treat any comorbidities. Sometimes you might be saying you're having problems controlling heart failure, but maybe a comorbidity. Yes, sir. Number seven, and this is critical, assess the need for device therapy. We find that a lot of patients come for device therapy too late. They will have suffered for so long, or when they come, it is just too late to, yes, device to, get, therapy, the to get the benefit from it. So there are lots of devices that can help. And luckily, um, in cardio care, not only do we have the devices, they could be expensive, but we also have an affiliation with an NGO that has um, some uh, refurbished oh, devices, gosh. which also work just as good. So for patients that are unable to afford the bigger ones, they are also these ones are also available for them. Okay, and then monitor, monitor, monitor. I will not talk about this multidisciplinary care. Yes, that's what I want to say. That the management of heart failure is not a doctor only affair. Exactly. For a patient to be successfully managed for heart failure, you need a lot of people. Yeah. So it's a multidisciplinary approach that works for patients with heart failure. Right? You need your nurses, you need your dietitian, you need your social worker, you need people in charge of rehabilitation, you need physiotherapists, the doctors must be there, you need your endocrinologist. So the whole team, because from the beginning, you need somebody to cancel this patient. Even the cardiologists, you need different types of cardiologists. Yes, you need general cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, uh, uh, you need cardiothoracic surgeons. Invasive. So everybody has to has a role to play. Someone needs to cancel, someone needs to follow up, someone needs to look after the diet, someone needs to be in charge of the exercise for the rehabilitation program. Some of these patients may need to change job. Exactly. An occupational therapist may need to come in because, like you said, this is a lifelong life condition. Please don't take it lightly. Heart failure needs a lot of care. Even in the of best care. of centers where everything imaginable in this world is available, heart failure is a debilitating Jesus. condition. It is very costly. Both in terms of fund, both in terms of economic impact, yeah. and the impact on not only the patient but also the caregiver and the larger society. Okay, so what was your patients know about heart failure? By the time you see a patient, we say one of the first principles is teach, teach them about the disease. Tell them that it's not the end of the world. Tell them that I mean, teach them the nature of the disease. One of the reasons why our people are running from pillar to post, drinking all kinds of things is that doctors are not teaching. We are telling them to go and buy drugs. We need to teach. The first meaning of doctor is teacher. So we teach them about the disease so that they are not easily confused. Somebody will not tell them that they stepped on a juju in their village. No, they did not step on anything. You need to explain it to them, how the fluid is coming to their leg. So teach them the drugs, teach them to know the alarm signs, when they need to get to the hospital. I typically teach them to buy, so they buy a fig, yes, but if you buy a wind scale, wind scale yes. and use that to measure fluid congestion as it's happening or not, and then address you know, psychological needs, they should not be surprised when they see the staff need depressed or other things, and they should know that they can address it properly. Okay, so teach them to weigh themselves regularly and to, uh, you know, if weight starts increasing, they should notify the healthcare provider, fluids, and to limit sodium. So typically, there are some times when we have a normal sodium diet. Uh, but okay, typically, it's a low sodium diet. diet. Okay, sir, what do you think? So, when should we refer or when should we admit? In my own ex little experience, I think every heart failure patient, yeah. even at the point of diagnosis, need a specialist review. New diagnosis of heart failure. Need a specialist review. The specialist can refer discuss with you and the patient initiates the treatment plan and you can continue with the follow-up. But I think at the point of diagnosing a new patient with heart failure, yeah. you need a specialist input. I've seen somebody that has been managed for heart failure for long and because the time I came, there was no heart failure at all.
at all at all. Okay, so sometimes you need to make the diagnosis, yes. to make the correct diagnosis, and to set the person on the right treatment. Yes, sir. These drugs we have given, we have listed, they are very good, but they must be put in a particular order and yes. at a particular time based on the you give them imperio, that bad you know, the patient, you get, get, the get, worse. get worse. Okay, so you need to give them in a particular sequence and order, and then uh, some of these things you need to know. Yes. So if your patient is not getting better, yeah. You need to refer for a specialist care. Patient with advanced heart failure, and my own definition of advanced heart failure is patient with NYHA three and four. Yeah. Or if we say using the AHA staging from C above, you should yeah. see a specialist. When you have a patient in cardiogenic shock, that one is without a doubt. The blood pressure is very low, it's unrecordable, blood pressure is less than 90 over 60. Please and please. Patients have come with cardiogenic shock, unrecordable blood pressure, and yes, gone sir. home. In fact, they are still seeing us two years after. But if it was not managed well, it would have gone. So get a specialist, get specialist input early. Okay? Then when patient had other comorbid conditions, diabetes, patients with maybe asthma, DVT, yeah. or patient has myocardial infarction, evidence suggesting of pulmonary embolism, their patient should be managed in a specialist center. And when you have a problem with your therapy, you start a therapy and patients uh, deteriorate or there's complication from the treatment you give him, like the patient I just mentioned, yeah. you should do well to, to repair. Now, if you, have, if you are far away from Abuja, you cannot repair to cardiac care, at least admit that patient and you know, stabilize the patient on the, on the bed. And then you can get each other's input. Um, at the end of we'll show you our WhatsApp group. You can send questions to the WhatsApp group. So you can join the WhatsApp group. Send to, if you have challenges or questions, you can put them there. And we, one of us will be more than happy to answer it. Of course, you know our standard. You will first suggest an answer first before we now correct you. We will not just give you an answer like that. OK, so we want you to grow. OK, so and sometimes when we are starting a new therapy for a patient, sometimes we have to admit, yes, um, you know. So there are other things that we need to do. If there's a new a precipitant that you are seeing, a new arrhythmia, a lot of arrhythmias, and we talked about ECG. If you, have, if you don't know how to read an ECG, please go on our YouTube page. You will see reading the ECG. We did that this year, we've done that last year. Yes, so go on our YouTube page, you can hear it again. And I'm there, and I assure you, if you follow those steps on YouTube on this topic, you'll be able to read an ECG. Um, if there's severe high blood pressure, other illnesses, and sometimes when there's a uh, complication, Yes. You started treatment and the patient is now either over diuresing, they've lost too much weight, BP is, is low, they are feeling dizzy, things like that, you know, sometimes. And occasionally just patient requests. Yes. Sir. Okay. So those are the things that you should consider for referral and or for admission. Most of when they come here, we admit them. But clinically, we don't admit. But that's at our discretion because we know how to manage them. We manage hundreds of patients, you know, every month and every year. Okay, so how will we follow up patients with heart failure? So these are some considerations. So, sir, can you go over this? So, when you are discharging your patients, this is part of what should be in the education and your rehabilitation program. So your patient is going home. You have to educate the patient and give some targets that you want. One, the patient, most of the time, the patient is going home on the diuretic. So you want to tell the patient, oh, how do you want to monitor that the drug you are taking is working yeah oh every day i want you to take as you're going into the bedroom to take your bath please sir Check take it. your weight the same time every day yeah we want this your weight to be going down by 0.5 kg and not more than yeah. one kg daily until all the until fluid. the fluid is out and you come back to adjust your medication so you decide your patient and patient went home with 55 kg after two days it became 58 kg you should tell the patient to come back to the hospital otherwise the next time the patient will start with difficulty in breathing yes or the patient goes over your medication and it's not passing urine adequately exactly. the patient, so you need to
Uh, we're back. Sorry for the break in communication. Um, we're it's a reminder back. we're still in Nigeria. <laughs> Nigeria will be better. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about the thing that you should uh, check and follow up. Follow up. And things that we should check and follow up. And uh, we say that when you are following up, check their diet. Also, talk to them about their drugs. Typically, when they are coming, let them come with all their drugs. Yes, sir. Look at it. Make sure that they're not taking steroids. They're not taking anything. You may need to adjust some drugs when the heart rate is less than 50, especially drugs that reduce the heart rate too low. You know, you need to check all of that as as you are as patient is on admission or when the patient is in the clinic. Those are things you need to check. Fluids, fluids. How much to take? Sometimes we see patients on heart failure. Everybody on admission does not need any fluid. Now, the patient with heart failure, they are on drip. You should be very careful. Now, if you patient needs fluid while they are in heart failure, one of the key things to do is to keep a central pressure line, a CVP line, connect it to a CVP monitor and be monitoring. The central venous pressure okay so if you don't have that you should be now cautious typically leave your fluid intake to typically 1.5 liters per day not more than that or even less or less one to 1.5 liters per day so put that fluid there and then consider anticoagulation if they are outpatient and they have um, an atrial fibrillation you typically need to have um you know anticoagulation if they are on bed and inpatient you need to give a prophylactic dose Otherwise, your patients will not die from the heart failure. They will die from a pulmonary mm -hmm. embolism, and that can be a problem. We've had a lot of patients with intracardiac clots, clots yes, in the heart. Yes, clots in the heart. Yeah. So for those ones, one, you have to start at therapeutic dose of the anticoagulation, yes. and they may even need more invasive therapy. Uh, therapy. Now, a lot of times, our drugs of choice are the new novel oral anticoagulant, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and um, uh, dabigatran. Those are the things we typically use, and we get quite good results with it. So it's quite important to know. What else are you checking? The basic pulse. Yes. Check the regularity. Check the rates. Typically, if you're having very irregular rates or regular pulse, so patients should not come to clinic and you not check their pulse. If they have very regular pulse. Please get an ECG. If the pulse is having up and now, consider having a holter ECG. Now, a holter is that we attach the ECG and the patient goes home. And it records the ECG for 24, 48, even 96 hours. So um, if you cannot have that done, you can send them over to cardio care. We can have that checked for you. So that if patient is having a lot of ventricular activity, they need a device. Don't um, don't you know deprive them of this opportunity. Some people can get these devices and live longer so that we don't come and hear any story. Oh, they suddenly fell down, suddenly collapsed and died. And apart from that, if though if this is not uh, addressed, the patients will keep coming back with complaints. So whether the cost is too low yes. or the cost is too high, you have to identify and address it adequately. Now, blood pressure, blood pressure, blood pressure. So typically, um, 90, 90 over 60 to 130, 80. Now you can see we wrote 90 over 60. Sometimes we have 100 over 65. And we still continue to give those, those drugs. Why? Because those drugs help the heart. Yes, sir. Once the heart starts getting better, the blood pressure will start going up. Sometimes people make a mistake. Blood pressure is 110, 108, 70. They say they are stopping all the drugs. Stop it. The blood pressure is now normal. You stop the drug, the heart failure worsens and the blood pressure goes down further. Giving those hypertension drugs will help. You do it where sometimes you need to start increasing the dose. What? Okay, you increase the dose and like that. So, very important. If you follow up on yes, ECG and F. So once you make a diagnosis, it is only a whether the patient is getting better. Add the regular beta uh, blocker or amiodarone and yeah. patient getting better is or. or now gone is this patient you want to look at the qrs is the qrs uh, complex is it increasing for you to decide whether this patient needs some form of added device on what you're doing echo definitely you must do is this patient still in the reduced ejection fraction or yeah. the ejection fraction has improved yeah is there a new world motion abnormality is this patient having an ischemic heart disease 
Is there any valvular problem? Or maybe when your patient, the uh, myocardial infarction or the cause of the substance, is there a complication? We know you have, we have seen patients that after follow up FO, we saw a lot of how often you should, How often should you come here? If you start treatment and your, and your patient is getting better, at least first at diagnosis, I would suggest another one, three months after yeah. commencing treatment, then subsequently you can do twice mm -hmm. in a year. So if you have done the first one, like we said before, the general fraction is low. You've now put and put all this mass fine drug that we talked about, the perio, the patitocin, and patitocin, you put a beta blocker, you put pyrolactone, you put the fusema as needed, and other drugs as needed, the patient is getting better. Three months, review that echo again. If the uh, injection fraction is still low, that patient may still, will likely still qualify for a device. So you need to have an, 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 an ICD put in to prevent sudden death. Now, a lot of patients will have improved and may not need a device, but some will need a device at that point. Now, if the QRS is widened and the ejection fraction is low, that patient, and the patient is still having symptoms, you should consider a CRT. CRT may be expensive, but CRT really dramatically changes quality of life. It changes length of life. That is, we are doing biventricular pacing. We put in three leads into the heart. Left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium. Then we connect it to a device and put it inside under the screen. That typically makes the, the uh, function of the heart improve significantly. These are red flags that you follow up. Patient is gaining weight or not losing weight. Slow pulse, fast heart pulse. Urine output is not good. Sodium is low or potassium is low. Blood pressure is very low with cold extremities. These are red flags. Even if they're happening while patients are admission, you need to get um, urgent input. If you don't do something, you will see the outcome and it's not be pretty. And then new onset chest pain as will happen. There are sometimes we say patient is um, heart failure of intractable. What do you think? I read somewhere that the most common cause of intractable heart failure is a wrong diagnosis. Yes, that, that's <laughs> the most important. Like you said, we have seen a diagnosis of heart failure, and by the time MP, FO, the I remember I did one recently. I had to call to also come and see the four. Diagnosis is 100. Because a lot of patients come with despair. Despair and the BMP is normal. The chances are. The chance that that is very low. That's number one. Number two, biology and the precipitants. Exactly. If we patients can never get better. Fruitsimide can never make a patient with heart failure better. to get better. So you give Fruitsimide, if you like, give 200 milligram TGS. <laughs> if you don't do beta blocker, you don't do spirodolactone, you don't do other important drugs, your patients will not get better. If you are treating your patient and your patient has hyponatremia, yeah. hyperkalemia, yeah. hypokalemia, blood sugar, abnormality, and you keep giving all the best drug, your patients will not get well. If you are underdosing your patients, yeah. when you're supposed to increase the doses of your medication and you are not doing that, or you are giving too much, your patients will not do well. And this, if you look at all these reasons, these are the reasons why you yeah. need a specialist help. Exactly. And, and at this time, and sometimes your patients are having advanced heart failure and they need devices. You are giving drugs, 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 and you're not getting better. Typically, we put a device. Sometimes we put a device, <laughs> unfortunately, we stop seeing the patient. It's now us that start <laughs> calling the patient. Oh boy, how far now? You don't come clinic again. Because <laughs> that's a patient that was struggling for a long time. So those devices are critical. And in Nigeria, we are one of the people that put the lowest number of devices worldwide, despite our already high prevalence. And it's something that can be addressed with knowledge that we are sharing um, today. Okay, so these devices we're talking about are devices useful in heart failure. As you can see, I'm just coming from the cat lab. Dr. Edafe is here. The other interventionists are around. We just left. So typically, three types of devices are used. Pacemakers, but pacemakers are not specifically for heart failure. But in patients that have reading problems that need a pacemaker, it yes. will help. 
But pacemaker is not really for heart failure. Now we have a conventional device that is the real one for advanced heart failure and implantable defibrillators, which help to reduce sudden death, yes. help to prevent primary um, cardiac death. Why do we need pacemakers? Automatic. They need a pacemaker. Exactly. Most patients, you know, and some other things. So when they see they had some faults here and there, another reason but otherwise if they have any fainting probably after water or heart we will need to have the case then we should with arch failure yeah that as indication for use of a crt device with a peacemaker insert uh, that typically will hand. give him a better. So you're not just you're not just pacing the heart generally. You pace both ventricles yes, and sir. help to combine the power of both ventricles to give a result. Now for ICD, anybody that suffers cardiac arrest and we've had patients, and if you come for the abundant cardiac symposium, you can see it at the bottom of your screen, 8th and 9th of December. We will teach you how to do a resuscitation, basic life support, advanced life support. Once you've done that, a patient has survived it, typically you should have. An, a, an ICD put in so that anytime you remember the footballer that is now in Manchester United and he's doing well though. Uh, 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 my is trying small, but not very well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so he has his own device there. So I typically use that to encourage patients. See somebody playing football, not at professional level. You can have this thing and you can live a normal life. So anytime they have a structural heart disease, in terms of heart failure, when the ejection fraction is less than 35 percent yes, and NYT class two or three, or less than 30 percent in class That's one. one typically you should consider an ICD, especially when you have treated for at least 40 days and they are still having digestion fraction. Please and please don't deprive your patients. The money for burial is more than the cost of uh, ICD. And a lot of patients die. A lot. A lot of patients die from some of this condition. And we just think, oh, the patient is bad. The patient, you know? is, not, uh, the patient is bad. And arrhythmias are typically still one of the most common reasons why patients with heart failure will die. And die. We had this patient, 57 year old, with heart failure. ECG showed QRS was wide, you know, diagnosed uh, two years ago. Some minimal improvement. In the previous year, however, 6,000. Can you see the BMP? 80%. And then it was referred. Um, after that, YK came low and he has. Is up to two years. Doctor, that is very, very well. When we put a CRT in the heart from both sides, so if one part of the heart was not pumping well, we are now trying to put for that. So that essentially is what the CRT. We have these ESC guidelines. I want you to just look at this heart failure, NYK two. Says. Check the QRS and check if their sinus reading. If the QRS is high and their and their sinus reading put a CRT. Yes. Okay. If the QRS is less than that and they are not in sinus reading, then consider ICD. Okay. So those are some things that we should um, look at in this algorithm. So um, still still the same thing. So just look at your QRS interval. Exactly. Once your QRS interval is 150 and above, your patient needs CRT. CRT. Or if it's 130 and above and they have yeah. left body branch, branch block. block. Yes. Now, thank God for a lot of people are saying what is QRS duration. I have a lot of it. A lot of uh, ECGs accurately measure the QRS. Yeah, just so look, look at that QRS interval. You see where it's calculated here. So you can look at that. And then if it's less than, so anything more than 130, you need to consider it. So, and that is how it looks when we put, and we put quite a number of CRTs in this um, center. We've been presented our paper on almost 35 cases that have been done um, so far. And thankfully now we have some for indigent patients which have been donated and some for the normal patient, which could be a little bit expensive, but there is no price on life. Again, this is the uh, nice one. 
you can see if the QRS is, look at the first column, upper left column. Okay, you can see my mouse. So if the QRS is less than 120 and patient is NYK1, put an ICD if there's a high risk of sudden cardiac death. NYK1 to 3. Three. Anytime there's heart failure, NYK1 to 3, and the QRS is less than 120, ICD. However, when the NYK4 and the QRS is small, because the risk of death is very high, then it is not clinically indicated because you may just put it and the patient is still going to die in two months anyway. So now, however, if it's 120 to 149 without LBB, from NYK1 to 3, consider ICD. And if it's NYK4, CRTP with pacemaker. Okay. In most cases, we also do CRTD here. You know, not just P because of some other uh, things that you may consider, including reducing sudden cardiac death. But of course, there's a significant price difference. So this depends on who is paying. In this case, in this guideline, the UK government is paying. So those things are considered as well. Now, if they don't have, uh, if they have left on new brand block, however, from NYK2, you should start switching CRT and not just ICD. And if it's greater than 150, Indications for devices. I was saying that these devices and these therapies are very much available um, in the country, and patients with heart failure should be offered this. It's critical. So you can see anybody with NYK one to four. In most cases, there is a uh, there's an indication. So for one, type for, of device, for one or device or the other. Now, if the if you don't think that they have a high risk of sudden cardiac death, and they are NYK class one and the QRS is, so those are the people that you can be saying, okay, maybe, maybe not. But once their QRS starts prolong, prolonging and the NYK class, even though the NYK class, you see that there's a need for device. This makes the difference. And it's important that Nigerian heart failure patients get the best, the best drug therapy, the best medical therapy, the best counseling, the best dietary advice, the best specialist care, and the best device therapy. A lot of times we have stopped at medical therapy in Nigeria, but that is available and available here in cardio care. And cardio care is essentially less than 90 minutes from anywhere in Nigeria. And so the patients can get it wherever. Um, we are coming to an end shortly. So we talked about this multidisciplinary measure um, management. But Ola Leto already talked about it, the cardiology, everybody, both interventional and clinical cardiology, social worker, primary care physician, health information. And it's very important. Calling these patients to find out how they yes, are doing is important. Following them up. Find out the local problems that they are having in their family setting could affect their long term outcome a lot, a lot because especially these new medications, yeah. the SGLT2 inhibitor, yeah, they are, they are expensive. I just saw a patient today that is being concerned now, it is not strong. And I you know, I know these drugs really, really make a difference. Yes, so I have to tell him that, sir, it's like you are choosing between life and money <laughs> because stopping this medication is as if you want to you are saying you are tired of life so if you really know that life is important and it's more than money so these people need a lot of counseling a lot of support somebody has to call how, yes. you, how are you doing yeah how are you feeling are you taking your drug do you remember that your clinic appointment is next week and this is why we also at cardio care accept almost all insurance companies and we are going further to try and talk to the national body if the insurance can cover especially most of these high-end therapies and um, so um so remember heart failure is a chronic condition it produces worse than cancer most cancers you know good history and examination is very important the guideline directed medical therapy is critical in long-term care um, early device therapy is of paramount importance even here in Nigeria 
and get to the specialist early is important and multi-study approach is, is critical. So we'll take some questions now. But before we do where we are coming from, that's not already come yet. Okay, that picture also show you. So um cardiac society for the pioneer, um, cardiovascular uh, and uh, the pioneers is where support service for practice and collaboration we have different areas for cardiologists two current thoracic surgeons several Senior residents will take to us from the University of Portaco to to and um, to Guagala. We are collaborating to help um, in the training of cardiologists as well. Um, we have this symposia, and I was telling you about the symposia coming up on the 8th and 9th, which you should make sure you are there. In fact, all the people that have come can have nothing but good things to say. You should be there, doctor. Everybody is doing press up. We are preparing fantastic messages. I mean, uh, I say messages. <laughs> fantastic teaching for you. Okay. And then the peripheral vascular disease seminar. This was the last, uh, last, last, seminar. last seminar. And as you can see, the people there, um, there is a very big thing. Lots of pharmaceutical companies, physical companies. Uh, we had over 350 participants from 17 states. So December 8th and 9th here in Abuja. Uh, Take your leave now, plan ahead, 10 CME points, certificates, basic life supports, management of all these diseases, one-on-one -on -one interaction with all the consultants you have been seeing online. Now you will meet us in person. So come over, book your ticket now, you know, and then come over ahead. It doesn't cost anything. Okay. Um, so we train them, and that's what we have done. We've also done this national interventional cardiology symposium, the first of its kind. We had 41 attendees, typically specialists from several countries several states of the, of the of the nation and we also had international participants and during this time we did lots of free procedures this was the first national international academic symposium hosted here in cardiac care uh, i want to tell you that is the picture of an icd and if you look at the picture of this icd um look at the picture of this icd you can see this See this place that looks thicker than the rest of the wire. That is defibrillation coil that helps to shock the heart when the heart is going wrong. If you look at this tracing, this was a case that we did um, recently. We were doing an angiogram to, to check for any blockage in the coronary vessel. Patient just started having a what will happen internally. The patient stays alive rather than timely demise. And that's critical for us to. So in, in Nigeria, and you, and you can see that are going for amputation, passing our catheters vessels in the heart, and these are the kind of patients. Um, consultants are here. But you can call us. Cases have been done in a lot of ultra modern equipment. Numbers you can call, especially for interview, having a heart attack, needs only numbers you can use. Please indicate your name and your email and phone number so that a lot of times we finish with, with exactly where we want to send you back referral. This call back, so please indicate it so that we can call you and explain that so while we are taking questions you can scan this on your on your screen uh, so that you can join the whatsapp group and you can have access to the entire community of abuja medical symposia once you scan this you join the group you are seeing a patient but remember we said give a possible answer then we will also try and answer answer as well so we'll take questions if if there are um so i'll start from number one would it yes you will, will share the slides to the emails that you have registered 
So if you register, register with your email, we will share the slides to you. Um, uh, please read them and use them in your practice. And we'll also share a link to your email so that you can watch it again and again. Please share it with other people, share it with your colleagues. If you are in WhatsApp group, people are sharing things about election. Good for them. Share slides that they can also improve in their practice. So that's so you can we will share the slides. Um, what is the place of bronchodilators in effort dyslexia of congestive heart failure? Dr. Oladeko. I like this question, and that is why we took time to explain the pathophysiology of heart failure. Thank you. And of heart failure, there is nothing like a bronchoconstriction. Yeah. And that is why it is good for us to know what is causing this patient's difficulty with breathing. If your patient has heart failure and you have confirmed that the patient has heart failure, there is no use for bronchodilator in the management of the patient. Use for bronchodilators in the management of the patient. Just for clarity, not only is there no use, using bronchodilators will worsen the yes. outcome. It so, will increase the heart rate. It may precipitate arrhythmia in the patient. Yeah. So it's going to make your patient worse. Remember the treatment that we are giving, beta blockers, blocker. to cancel that. Now you are giving a beta agonist yeah, to further push it. In fact, you are working against the heart. So please, 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 this is one of the very reasons why we had this. Um, take time and make your diagnosis. If you are not sure, you are truly not sure, it can be difficult, even for all specialists. It can be difficult. That is why we have so many tools. Yes. Do your ECG, do your end terminal for BMP. BMP. If you are in Abuja and environment, send the sample here. We can you get the result within 15 minutes. Once it is high, you are most likely to tell you the you are most likely. And if it's normal, you are less likely to be doing it. And it's something we see every day. We, we, there's a patient that came here two days ago with the diagnosis of asthma, precipitated by pneumonia. And the male government was cough at night. But when we talk to the patient very well. What he was actually having was PND and you're talking. And by the time we did his EF, uh, his echo, his ejection fraction was 25%. Wow, wow. So, so in patients, somebody asked, in patients with stage 4 CKD, can I use metulazone instead of spironolactone? Okay, good. It's a very good question. I like this yes. question. It helps me to explain something. All directives are not the same. In this case, you remember, we talked about the four therapies that we are, the therapies we are giving. Spironolactone that we are giving is not just for diuresis. It is mainly because it is an aldosterone antagonist. antagonist. Don't forget, aldosterone antagonist. Number one, it helps the testing axis yes. that worsens the to reduce fibrosis in the myocardium. Yes. Spironolactone is critical. Instead of, if you have to give Right, you may give those, yes. especially if the patient and metolazone and add on is not you have tried as much as and the patients you can now add to your treatment. The kidney function. kidney function and the blood pressure, so it could drastically So be very careful. I suggest using metolazone should be reserved for specialists. Um, please, can you go over the classification of? Okay, so it's not a classification. When we do echo, we do. Look for E over E prime. Um, that E over E prime is a indication of left atrial feeling pressure. When E over E prime, I'm almost virtually sure that there's an elevated feeling pressure of the, the, to the left atrium. It, it is less likely, meaning that heart failure is less likely if, or at least it is being treated Treating somebody, I am not sure whether you're getting well. Once getting less than eight, 
Now, between 8 and 15 is typically a gray area. So once you have that period, you typically have to corroborate it with okay. any. So that's what we mean by E over E prime. And this is important when you have a patient with normal ejection fraction. Yes. And you still want to know at failure. So your E over E prime, over e prime is critical. Into In this practice, in cardiac care, we do E over E prime for every, every patient, patient, heart failure, hypertension, whatsoever, because you could have a very high E over E prime, normal, normal EF, and the patient could be in heart failure. And you say, no, EF is fine. And we know that up to 50% of patients, and we do our BMPs too. So up to 50% of patients with heart failure have a normal ejection fraction so that you don't miss them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one more question I can see. At what stage of heart failure is beta blocker introduced? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, it's not about stages. Yes. Uh, so heart failure can be introduced at any of the stages. Uh, beta, blocker, beta blocker, sorry. But typically, we try and wait for the blood pressure to be U, yes. to be U volume. Yes. Can you explain that? So again? you want to at least try and manage the acute decompensation in the patient before you start your patients yeah. on beta blocker. So you want to make sure that you deal with congestion. Yeah. You start all the other drugs, the spironolactone, your dapagliflozine or empagliflozine your sacubitri vasatan yeah. duperio you want to use that first and get the patient a little bit better before you introduce your beta blocker if you introduce your beta blocker early because once you start your beta blocker the initial two three four days the patient feels some kind of deterioration yeah. even when the patient is not congested so i, I should explain that so to the patient. you should explain that to your patient that this drug that i'm giving you in the first two to three days you may feel a little bit bad but after that time you start getting benefits from it so you want the patient to be less congested yeah the blood pressure is more stable so if you're having your patient at maybe 90 over 60 and you want to start all this drug at the same time you may end up tilting your patient to hypertension or shock and the patient feeling very bad. So it is not about staging, it's just about knowing the right time to gradually introduce your beta blocker and build up gradually over time. All right, I think we've answered all the questions. Are there any burning questions? I can see a hand up. Um, is it a mistake? Are your DG or La worry? You want to speak? I did your lawry. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Pamela, I need to be able to hear the question. No, just increase your volume here. Okay, I can't hear him. Um Dr. Wimbola Ogunkelu. You can unmute yourself and talk. I can see your hand is up. Yes. Good evening. Um, I can't see you. You can't see yourself. You can talk. You can just talk. Okay. I just want to so, so, to state my appreciation for the good work you are doing at um, Cardio Care. It's my actually my first time of joining your your webinar. webinar conversation webinar teaching program please keep it up i'm a i'm a cardiologist a fellow of the nigerian cardiac society okay thank you very much thank sir. you very much sir your name sounds very familiar that's what we're saying well i okay thank you so much sir. we really appreciate uh, we really appreciate that, sir. No, it's so, finished. Some other questions have come up in the chat box. Thank you so much, Dr. Abimbola, Dr. Abimbola Obunkeli. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. So there are some other questions that um, in the chat box. An allergic rhinitis patient with congenital heart disease with newly diagnosed of heart failure can the patient continue with his evamis since you said steroids 
oh, and it's are not good. So can you continue the ever means? So typically, um, benefit to an, and risk determination has to be done uh, by the specialist. So, but typically, inhaled steroids, topical steroids, in a case that absolutely needs it, may be used concurrently, but they, you should use with caution. And we are even talking about chronic long term use. Yes. So, use of Evermis, the drop over a few days to treat the rhinitis, we don't do, uh, uh, we don't cause a lot of problems. And we have to be careful because of this medication can also affect. It. So, use for a short um let me see i didn't hear explanation on use of labetalone there's no place for treatment of heart failure causing about a patient that's Pregnancy with diphenyl, diphenyl in the mix, and some of the drugs presentation, but there is no place for the use of the management of heart failure. Okay, so labetalol, we don't use it, please, as much as possible. We know that labetalol has some beta blocking, but it also has alpha blocking and it's non specific. So, in terms of treatment of heart failure, it typically worsens care. So please um, be careful if you have to use it. Occasionally, we may we have very severe blood pressure and all of that. So, um, so all right. So um, thank you, sirs. Please, what is the in what other conditions can BAP be elevated, especially in patients on admission, and what is the significance in these instances? What level of significance is in this instance? So you can see that um, we had we showed you cutoff points for on admission or ambulatory. Now, um, in patients with renal failure, in patients with sepsis, some forms of sepsis, you know, they cause myocardial injury, myocardial injury, myocarditis, a lot. There are a lot of both cardiac and non-cardiac conditions. Patients with CKD. Yes. They so, they, so you have to. When, when we're talking of, when you're analyzing your results, you're analyzing context of, of symptom, the, sign, and the result, puts the result together. So and that, that's why you're going to go to the lab and just do it. Uh, you, must, you must marry them together to be able to help you make it. Clear. And I also don't think you need to cram the, the values. values. Each, once, once you do, they always yes. come with their reference value. You, the cutoff is always there. So you don't need to cram. A, 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 the, the particular value, but it is there you, when you get the slide. You, but once you do, they always push your patient to it. Somebody most likely leptolazone is an add on diuretic, your choice. And if you have used those, and, you, and, and then you can you know, consider adding it as a can add on. Remember that it's a sequential, sequential part of yes, the different of, part of, of the nephron. Right. But it is not a treatment type. And because it's a very powerful diuretic, it causes typically causes more electrolyte derangement and metabolic derangement. We could worsen your heart failure. So by the time you are starting with metalazone, you should have gotten to a point where you are having refractory edema, and now you are now combining it with all of these things. So you now combine, you now look at it, uh, look at the metalazone, and be, be careful to continuously monitor your E and U, and, and typically don't give it for too long. Find out what was causing the refractory. And then take it off and address the issue that may be precipitant in that situation. Okay, I think we have answered all the questions. Okay, I have one more question here. A patient with chronic heart failure on medications, but having persistent palpitation. So, what's your take and advice? Okay, thank you very much for that question. 
Make sure your heart failure comes with palpitations. It might take an advice is number one, where is that ECG? Look at that ECG again. Sometimes you look at an ECG, you could have missed it. So we look at ECGs over yes. and over and over. over again. Not only do we look at ECGs over and over again, we ask for our other inputs, Dr. Olive, how do you think? Dr. Olive, how do you think? Dr. Mary, how do you We ask ourselves over, is there something you, somebody else is seeing? Number two, you should consider doing a holter, yes. a 24 or 14 hour ECG. The patient may be having a paroxysmal intracrypt. Yes, and they may need treatment or worse off, they may be having paroxysmal VT. Yes. And may need a device so that they don't um, have sudden cardiac death from, him, from an arrhythmia. So typically, fix your holter ECG, which is to put your ECG needs in a special device. They go home with it. Every time they have a patient, they record it. Then we come back and we analyze it. If you cannot have it done, they just refer them to have it done here. We we'll report it and send it back to you. And you can, and yeah, you can secondly, work on have you covered all the GGMT yes. medication? We exactly. Talk have you gone through all? Is this patient on a beta blocker? Yes. Is this patient on empagliflozin on an SDL2 in vitro? Empagliflozin or dapagliflozin? Those drugs were initially formed for diabetes. However, in the process of testing on diabetic patients, they found out that, that patients with heart failure active. were living longer. So it has, in fact, we have collected it from the endocrinologists. Yes. <laughs> it's now our drug, no longer their drug. And they are quite good brands in the market. Um, Boringa has one. Um, Mech, is it Mech? I think has one. Um, and Get Pharma has one. There are also out. generics available. So it's, it's really available and it makes a whole lot of difference in the patient care and long term management. Also remember that when this patient needs um, devices, they should get it at the right time. And we have seen the um, bill for devices. So I think we have answered almost all the questions. If you have any burning questions, you can write. Remind you that we have on the 29th of October. In exactly two weeks, on a Saturday, nine in Muse, sorry, Beauty Park with 40,000 only if you register ahead of time. Hospital.org slash Living Hospital.org slash MLS into medical law case to enjoy it, I assure you. You're going to improve doctor to a doctor. You need to understand, you know, the nooks and crannies of medical law. So come around, uh, 40,000 only, five CME points, cost materials will be given to you, lots of case studies we're going to go through so that you are not caught on our way and people don't take advantage of you. Like I was telling my team this morning, I can't sell square parts. So come and learn how to protect your certificates. And then of course, certificates will be given, refreshments will be given, and five CME points by the living hospitals will be available. I will remind you about the cardiovascular symposium, ACS, December 8th and 9th, two day course. Fantastic, this is the sixth year running. It's been awesome all this year, 10 CME points. Um, so get there, start registering. It is by my reckoning, the, the largest medical seminar in Nigeria at the moment where doctors are just seated and are, it's just teaching, not a conference, just a teaching for two days. It's the largest medical center in Nigeria. So you want, you want to be a part of this. Um, so in the absence of any questions, I thank, thank over the 120, 130 people that were in attendance. Um, we think it will be valuable for your time. You could join our WhatsApp group here. The, um, so just scan this and join the WhatsApp group so you can have access to the entire community. If you have questions burning still after this, Please go to the WhatsApp group, talk about it, uh, one of us. Will. But please remember that you must make an attempt to answer it. Then we'll now corroborate and add and do that. So that we make sure that it's not only one way traffic, that all of us are learning in this community. Thank you very much to everyone. And thank you to Cardio Care for hosting this um, webinar. Cardio Care is located in, in Abuja in area 11 Gariki, and this is how you can uh, make your referrals appropriately especially for patients that need all those advanced care and need we have um, four full-time cardiologists two interventionists so there are a lot of people on ground dietitians to make sure they get the full care and we have loads of devices that we put in every week so that we can sort out some of these issues um, god bless you and have a lovely weekend enjoy your weekend thank you thank you very much <laughs>